Welcome to Season 3 of the Listen by Heart podcast, where we feature stories from women of the South China Sea. I'm Jasmine Lo, and today I will be joined by Chua Guat Eng. Chua Guat Eng is a Malaysian novelist and professional writer. Her experience spans three fields of writing, commercial and corporate, academic and literary. She read English literature at University of Malaya Kuala Lumpur and German literature at Ludwig Maximilian University in Munich, Germany. In 2008, she received a PhD from the University Kebangsaan Malaysia or the National University of Malaysia for her thesis, From Conflict to Insight, a Zen-based reading procedure for the analysis of fiction. From January 2011 to March 2013, she was postdoctoral research fellow at University Putra Malaysia, focusing on Malaysian novels in English. Most of her professional life was spent in the corporate world as writer and as creative and communications consultant. She specialized in the development of strategies for advertising and promotional campaigns, corporate brand building programs, and the synergizing of corporate communication and business aims. Good morning, Guat Eng. How are you today? Morning. I'm fine, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us on this podcast. As you know, what we are trying to do with this project is to archive history, stories, our lives, women who come from the region surrounding the South China Sea, a place that's quite contentious recently. <laughs> yes. You were born in Rumbau in Negeri mm. Sembilan which is yes. a small little state. Perhaps uh, for our listeners, you could share with us a little bit about how it was when you were growing up. Well, I was born in Rambau, but I didn't grow up there. What happened was I was born during the Japanese occupation. You know, the Second World War and the Japanese occupation. 1943, is that right? Yeah, that was 1943. And at that time, my father was... Um, before the war, he had been working for the Malayan Railways and perhaps because he didn't look very Chinese, the Japanese didn't think of him as being Chinese and therefore didn't chop off his head. We, we might edit that. Well, no, don't, please, because it's terribly important that people remember the atrocities that, ha- that took place. Plus, it's part of our history, you know, although many people Many, of course, many people would rather we forget, but I think sometimes it's worthwhile remembering history. Mm. I think uh, I think you're right. And when when I said that, I was actually so consciously self-editing. Yes, I, and I don't think we should. Uh, we're talking about. I'm a fiction writer, you know, and I wouldn't write fiction if I wasn't very concerned about truth. But truth cannot be told in the normal way, right? very often because people will censor themselves and censor me so I have to do it through fiction And to, but to me it's terribly important that we remember our past, our history things that have been done to us by people and especially if they for the younger generation who are not aware we we are living in a generation of um, there's this word the cancel, cancel culture exactly so, for example, yeah. um, there there have been also some uh, great men in the past. Uh, mm. Recently in Australia, they found out there was a street name after him. They've also found out that he was a slave driver. So there were some people lobbying to remove his name and mm. also a plaque dedicated to him. So, Well, I know and I, I have to say that I disagree, you know, with this uh, cancelling of one's history. Mm. It is. You are actually cancelling out history. And nobody will remember later on in later generations. I think a better option is if you actually put a plaque up that explains this person's background, that counters the implicit honouring that you're doing by having this statue or name. Name him. Name, you know, call out this person, this dead person, you know. Yeah. And say, we are, if this is the the... the the, the statue or or whatever but this is the man and say what he did I think that's important I think that's a very very yeah. good point Gwen. and I, I love the fact that you brought up 
you know, the fact that you're using fiction to actually tell fact. Well, of course, that's what fiction, well, a lot, most, many fiction writers do that, you know. Unless they're deliberately writing pure for pure enjoyment, you know, the genre writers, fine. But I suppose if you're most serious writers that I know, they're actually dealing with facts, with realities as they write fiction. But I was going to tell you about my father. He was then the station master of this little little train stop somewhere in the southwest of the Malay Peninsula. But I don't think we we spent much time there because soon after that we moved it was then known as Port Slagner but it's now Port Lang where my father continued to work with the railways so that was a job it was a job related the move ah yes 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 and and yes. basically the entire family went along as well well of course yes yeah and how old were you i must have been an an infant i don't remember much of it you know you know we had relatives around us and um these relatives were part of my growing up years so we must have been there and because an uncle an uncle of mine who lived in Port Lang Port Swetnam was the one who gave me the pet name to be called yeah it's a custom that many people Malaysian Chinese like me of Peranakan whose uh, forefathers had lived here for many years very British in a way English educated and so on there would be a, a Chinese name on the birth certificate for official use but at home we would be given Malay names or English names and there were pet names when when you mention Malay names for our listeners as well to understand the context of growing up as um uh, nyonya or peranakan can you share that how what does that mean to speak malay at home but we didn't speak malay at home because our language was english my father having been, my both my parents having been english educated and so on and so forth you know the malaysian chinese the chinese who live in malaysia today not all of them came during the colonial period many of them came before some the the descendants who now live mean they went to malacca they came during the time of the ming dynasty i think sometime in the 16th century yeah but my my forefathers didn't weren't the chinese who went to malacca in that uh, when they came during the ming dynasty my father my my forefathers were in thailand and my grandfather they must have been there for for several generations because my grandfather owned land he owned paddy lands which part of thailand is this the southern part of thailand closer to kedah yes yes yeah that was all part of thailand you know perlis and kedah Kelantan, our northeastern states up in the peninsula, were part of Thai of of Thailand of Siam. It so that called. means you were born in Rembau in Negeri Sembilan, but your your generational history goes back further further north. Yeah, yeah. Where were your parents born? I don't know. My my father was definitely born up there. up in the north and at that time all that was during my grandfather's time it was all part of Siam or Thailand but in 1908 or so the british um signed a treaty with the king of Thailand of Siam the it's called the Anglo Siam Treaty in return for lands i think on the burmese border the thai king gave up some parts of his land in the south they became part of british malaya so when people say that we came to malaya we can't even say that of my family malaya came to us we were there yep. right and part of the land and the landscape you know so so yeah so that's how uh, we, be- we became and then of course for many uh, for the those chinese of that era who grew up during the british colonial period and all that it was quite natural to send 
their children to English schools to learn English because of the British thing. Yeah, my maternal grandfather was English educated too, and he actually worked as a legal clerk in Kuala Lumpur. Yeah. I understand what you mean now by basically the, the the entire family has been educated and also worked within government service. Yeah. So yeah. that's so much um, of that culture. It's it's the Malayan, the colonial English culture. Yeah. Yeah. And do you, and do you think that's possibly why you went into writing and the communication in the no. I don't think so. One of the things, of course, is that when I graduated from university, when I came back from Germany, uh, that was in the early 70s, the very English colonial, is that, does that explain why I became a writer? I don't think so, you know. I mean, I'm the only member in one. My family has taken to writing. But uh, working, working in Malaysia in the early 70s, when there was a national language policy, when English had lost its a privileged position, people like me, with a, a command of the English language, found it easy to get jobs in the private sector. That makes sense. It, it was it was necessity, and then it was also what you already had. You were gifted with it already. Well, yeah, I it was part of, of me, you know. I. I went into advertising because it was, it was the, a job I applied to, you know, and I got it and that's it. What were the types of campaigns you were working on then? I quite enjoyed doing a whole series of several campaigns actually for ICI things. And nowadays, I can't even, I don't even, I, I don't think it's even being sold nowadays. I think it's merged with Dulux and Dulux has absorbed the name. Just like how Oh, I see. We advertised Dula and Pentalite. Like that. Yeah, that was quite fun, advertising that. And then I did things like Nestle's milk, baby's formula. Oh, no, I can't say that, to answer your question, I can't say that my being Puranakan has anything to do with becoming a writer. Perhaps because of my ethnic ambiguity, having a Chinese name, Looking fairly Chinese, of course, there's always been Malay. I've got Malay or Thai great aunts. And what really made me write my first novel was that after 1969, the riot, May 13, they show up. Many of my friends who were Malaysians but ethnic Chinese were immediate planning to leave the country to emigrate. So they would apply this as well as at university and so they would be applying for scholarships to universities in Australia, Britain, um, America, you know. And the idea was that they should get that scholarship, go there, study and never come back. It was the big exodus. Yes, because I, they were kind of upset because, you know, the people who were English educated saw themselves people of my generation saw themselves as being entitled to elite positions. The English educated were educated by the British to be the rulers, you know, to, to be the, the, the gov government servants and so on, to keep the, the colonial machinery moving. And I think they were upset by the fact that they had the idea English no longer entitled them to that type of position. Honestly, I, I couldn't see, I couldn't understand why they, they thought like that. Because my Malay was no better than theirs. Because we didn't learn Malay, we didn't speak Malay at home and we didn't learn Malay in school. But I didn't, it didn't seem very reasonable to me, their argument that they now had to learn Malay, to them a foreign language. And Anna and I would say, we are, but English is also a foreign language, right? For you. You know, because they spoke Chinese at home. I said, for you, English is a foreign language. But you had no problem working with it. And so this kind of, I, I felt I didn't quite belong to the average Chinese Malaysian. I didn't feel I belong. At the same time, of course, I can't say that I am Malay either. Although culturally and in many ways, I feel more comfortable when I'm with Malay people. 
or even with Indian, but I really do not feel comfortable Chinese in Malaysia. There's there's a very good way of uh, telling how you identify when you were in when you were overseas in Germany, for example. Mm. How would you introduce yourself? Let's say you are at a social event. Mm. How would you introduce yourself? Because that is usually a good telltale. Like, oh, I'm Malaysian, or I am oh. Malaysian Chinese, or I am. You know, usually <laughs> no, Chinese no, would say I, that. I I um I just say who I am, my name. And of course, in, in Germany, for instance, very often, at that time in the early 70s, not many Germans had heard of Malaysia. They didn't know about Malaysia until the Malay, Malaysian football team went to play in, I think it was the Olympic Games, you know, and they were so impressed by our, our, our footballers. Was that um, the Sochin An days? I don't remember. I was never interested in football. But I remember uh, one German said to me, Oh, but these are not footballers, they're dancers. Because they were so graceful, you know, on the field and did so well. But uh, very often I would have been asked if I was Japanese. And I would say no. And they will say, they ask me where I'm from. And I'd say, Malaysia. And they would say, Ah, Singapore. I say no, Malaysia. <laughs> and then and then they make a connection and they say, ah, Malacca. Because I think on the map, this whole region, the Malacca Straits, I suppose I'm Malaysian, you know. I don't can't say I spend a lot of time thinking about it. But generally the feeling of being ethnically, culturally ambiguous. At the same time, I have to say this that I love this country. I cannot see myself living in another country. I mean, I've been to other countries and I love being there, but I want to come home. It's home. Malaysia is home to me. So, this sense of, of feeling that I don't quite belong to that the diaspora. I don't quite belong to the Chinese diaspora. I don't feel like my name is Chinese, you know, but I don't feel I belong there. That sense of not belonging. And, and so, I think it gives me an ability, I suppose, to look at them much more objectively than they can see themselves. I will say this very frankly, many of them are very racist in my eyes. Racist in that when they talk about non-Chinese, the Malay, especially excitement, I think it's more like colour, colour, skin, skin colourist. If you were fair, if you were white, therefore you were okay. I'm talking about Chinese people here, right? Generally in Malaysia. But if you were darker skin, right? Even if you were a Chinese with a slightly darker skin, a darker complexion, if you were Malay, if you were Indian, they have no space in their lives for you. It, it goes back to all of the forms that we have to fill in Malaysia until today. You have to tick those race boxes which do not exist anywhere else. These boxes that you have to tick, whether you are Malay, Chinese, Indian or Dan Lion Lion. So if, yeah. if we were to fall under Dan Lion Lion, which in English it translates to others. You are not Dan Lion Lion, you would be China. You'd be ethnically Chinese. But is that the reason to look down on people who, are, who have darker skin? I'm sorry. I don't particularly like there are people from Malaysia who are probably of Chinese origin and they're probably listening to this and they will hate me for this. But I have to say, because at some point it must end. This kind of unthinking prejudice must end. A lot of us from certain cultures grow up with these prejudices taught to us from from our older generation. It, yes. it trickles down. So it doesn't come from feeling forms. We have to be clear about that, right? Let's not excuse ourselves with things like that. What I was trying to get to was that they were from that generation that created those forms. I wonder why those forms were even created. Part of, of governance, 
you know, from the British days, you had to be, you you were classified into different things. And I feel forms. I don't feel that way about people who have darker skin than me. No, I, 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 I know people of an older generation who never had to feel any forms at all, but it comes with every word they speak. It's in the water they drink. So, no, maybe a cultural thing, it may be a Chinese thing, but I, I didn't like it, shall I say, when I saw this happening around me and it became more pronounced after the racial riots. It became more pronounced. What set me quite a bit was that years later, in the 1990s, especially in the early 1990s, partly I suppose because of the first Gulf War, we were doing very well economically and these people came back. They came back to the country not to not to settle or anything, but to sell themselves books they had written, things that they had made, and generally all simply to earn money to then take away back to their adopted country. I'm sorry, I could be talking about people like you, Jasmine, but you asked for this. So, <laughs> so I'm telling you what I feel. Why I wrote that first novel in the first place, I felt then, I saw it all as opportunism, that you will leave the country when it is in dire straits and come back when it's doing well. And I had to deal with that. I had to deal with that because many of them, these people were my friends and some of them were relative. It hurt me very much and it was out of this terrible sense of my God, I don't even want to talk to people like you. That was how I felt mm. that I wrote my first novel. It was out of that feeling, trying to understand what is it that makes Malaysian Chinese do that. So I therefore created a Malaysian Chinese character, somebody called Lim Ai Lian, and sort of set the situation for her in this country where she had left the country after the 1969 riots out of fear and then come back later for personal reasons and then suddenly found herself stuck here. How does she cope with it? How do people deal with it? What is it that makes them feel that way? So that that's what drove me to writing my novel. It was trying to answer existential questions, yes. you know, problems. You put it into a, a book of fiction. Yeah. Because it's through the writing that that I work out problems. See, I'm not a journalist. I'm not a, a propagandist. You know, I don't. I don't start with when I write something. I don't have like um, a, a, a theory or a thesis or a particular point of view that I want to get across. Usually, I start with a question: Why are people like? And then, as I write and as the characters begin to do things on their own, react to certain situations that turn up in my imagination and it's placed before the characters as they act and as I write their story I, I begin to understand what makes them tick I may not like them still at the end but I know what makes them tick I read somewhere recently that it's the lull and the quiet that become the most productive because it allows us you know that that emptiness allows us to work out a lot of things and in today's day and age with so much data technology content where do we even have time to process things so it, it's thank you for sharing how how you process that anger mm. was it jealousy also do you think a jealousy no why no, certainly not jealousy. Why would that be? Jealousy? I'm just trying to work out the emotion that you felt. Well, that's the thing that I had to work out myself. You know, it's not jealousy. It's actually, there I say this, it was actually disdain. Mm, disdain, okay. Yes. I didn't expect that emotion, but okay. Yeah. And I had to deal with it because, I, as I said, at home I didn't even want to talk to people. I didn't, I didn't want to call them my friends because I guess, you know, I kind of love this country. I'm a patriot, you know, and to me, this is my country. And when it's in trouble, I need to be here. I need to be here to make things change. I'm not going to run away. Sorry, Jasmine, but I'm not going to run away. And you know what uh, used to irritate me a lot was that people would listen to me and they'd hear me speak English and they'd say, 
why are you in this country? Why haven't you emigrated? <laughs> and it's as though I am here because I can't go anywhere else. As though no country will accept me. And, and that, that, that's the thing as well, that many of these people who left the country felt superior. I think that's... that's You've just hit the nail on the head, possibly. Yeah, yeah. They felt, oh, you know, other countries, they're willing to they accept us. And, you know, we are... And then they come back and they're trying to tell us how we should govern the country, what we should be doing and all that. And honestly, that irritates me a lot. That irritates me very much because I feel, I suppose, very much as the Chinese government, the mainland Chinese government now does about the US, you know, I keep thinking, we are going to learn on our own, you know, we are going to make our own mistakes. We're going to do things our way. Don't come and tell us how to do it. Many of those who left, they have gone on what I think of it as a cruise ship. They've taken the easy way to an easy life. We are left here building our own boats. We know what kind of boats we want. We don't particularly want your cruise ship experience. You understand? So all that, it's not jealousy, it's actually disdain. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. I'm probably alone, yeah. (laughs) No, you have spoken something that's not been looked into much because it's just something people don't talk about. You know, we, we talk about cookies, we talk about Hari Raya, Chinese New Year, we talk about food. We, we yeah. layer our lives with so much, like a kueh lapis, you know, mm. a layer cake. Mm. We, ha- we have so many layers and sometimes we don't talk about those layers. I suppose, yeah. And I suppose for many, of course, for many Malaysian Chinese, this players, well, their roots don't go very deep. I can understand that, you know. They may have come here that, that it may be just the grandfather at the very most who has come here, say, after the war, you know, to escape the communists in China. And they came here. So their roots are not as deep as mine, for instance. Yes. I can I can feel the sense of pride, the, the sense of Malaya or Malaysia or even Siam was your bloodland. The Semenanjung, the Isthmus of Kra, that, that entire strip. Exactly. And it's not just that, it's the whole, the whole, this Nusantara, the whole Southeast Asia. It's, we have absorbed the culture. So we are, we generally, amongst ourselves, we generally are kinder, more polite. We don't yell. Are you sure we don't yell? We do. I, my family, but we belong to that group. So we are more Thai in our behavior than Chinese, I would say. Mm. We are more Thai or Malay, you know, like our food or whatever. You know, but also the way we speak to one another, the way we behave, the way we hold ourselves, for instance. So there is a kind of like a distance from diaspora Chinese newer migrants yet. so that's what it means to be Peranakan and that's what it means to not speak Chinese at home One of our early conversations, you were sharing with me stories about when you were a child and feeling competitiveness in school at an early, early age. Yeah. No, I never, I never felt competitive. Other people felt competitive about me. But I, I, I just am not a competitive person. And that, I think, is your Malay, Thai, laid-backness, you know? Go ahead, I will say. Go and do well, you know, but don't pull me along and don't make me be part of it. You don't compete. Um, I guess that's it. That explains it. We're kind of late, late back. My whole family, we've all done well in our own fields, you know, but it's never with competition. It's doing what we want. Can we touch just a little bit on the women around your life, the women who influenced you? It doesn't have to be family, but... Let's say, for example, the the women who are in the pictures behind you. My mother, 
and my my father's mother on the you know on the top right is my my father's mother what was her name i have no idea uh-huh. because they were all dead before i was born my all my grandparents were dead before and the surnames and my mother died when i was 3 i'm sorry to hear that oh that's all right i lived with it what was your mother's um maiden name we w e so her her beginnings must be south from the south from malacca or singapore we siulan we siulan and from that surname you can deduce that she came from the south yeah because in the north if she were from penang or kedah or perak her we would have been spelled o o i i see because it's w e e it would be singapore or malacca definitely singapore if you look You know the Singaporean spell the we, W E E. It's like the yos, isn't it? The the Singaporean yos have uh, no H. No H. Why? Just no like H. Chua, for instance. My Chua has an H N. Right. And that will tell you that we originally came from the north. Ah. Right. In the south, the Chua has no H. And your name Chua what? Ing. So Chua mm. is the the family surname. Family surname. Yeah. And how would you say that? Did you ever know how it was said in in Mandarin in Chinese? <laughs> I've been told, but I can't get it right. Chai Yue Ying. Chai is Chua. Yue is Guat Moon. And Ying is a character that means heroic or something. So I named after the heroic moon. <laughs> Lovely. You know what the heroic moon is, right? Please share. Well, I was told. I don't really know. I was told because somebody said to me when he saw me, he said, "Oh, he said that is a term that is used by Chinese poets to describe a certain type of moon, autumn moon. We nowadays we call it the super moon, I think. The super bright moon. Yeah, when it's super bright, so that's why it's heroic moon. You know, that's when the moon is. Here. Do you know who named you? <laughs> My parents, but they had no idea. Somebody in the family must have said, "Listen, you've got to do this." We have, you know, uh, the three. I have two sisters, and the youngest of three girls in the family. Right? The first one, my my elder sister, her name is Cheng Suan, because my cousin of her age. They were Cheng something, Cheng Kim, Cheng Chu, and so on, you know. And so she was Cheng Suan. For some reason, my second sister, her name became Guat Si. So I think it's very possible that some, I, one of my parents, being away from the family and cut off from all the traditions, suddenly decided they liked the name Guat Si, and so changed. The the chain got broken. You know the old Chinese thing is to have all the girls of one generation at the first name must be the same, right? And that will tell you what generation they come from. My sister was Guatsi, and when I came along, they decided, oh well, we've made that mistake. You know, we better carry on, and they called me Guatsi. <laughs> I think that's my that's my fiction writer's. Explanation of the thing, and you were happy with that name. You never wanted to adopt like a, a English name. No, I think an English name at home, which I was desperately trying to get people to forget. You're not going to tell us, are you? No, I'm not. I asked me why did I become so uh, conscious of my of my Asianness, of my not being Western. Because I grew up speaking English, reading English books, watching English movies, and all that kind of thing. But what happened was, what saved my life, I think, my cultural life, my sense of identity, uh, was that when I was in the fifth form in school, uh, we had terrible science teachers, and I said they probably knew a lot, but they came from they came from Kerala, you know, India, and they couldn't speak English. Well, I had great difficulty understanding them, and it irritated me. Like anything, you know, so I'm not going to do science. 
So, but I didn't have enough subjects for for school cert, the Cambridge school certificate. You had to have at least seven subjects. I didn't have. If I took away science, I didn't have seven subjects. So we had an old master class, a uh, master, you know, who taught us history and maths in school. He, but I knew that he also taught Latin at home. He gave private tuition in Latin. Because in those days, if you wanted to study law or medicine at university, you had to know Latin. So there were a lot of people who went to him for Latin lessons. So I went to him and I said, "Mr. Vicky, I said, would you?" And he was an old Salonist from Salon, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I said, "Would you teach me Latin?" And I explained the predicament to him. So uh, he said, "Well, if you can get a few other girls, you know, they can join in." And then we will have a class, and so I did that. I managed to persuade three or four other girls to join us. Which town was this at? Guy? It was Klang. In Klang, yeah. and you were how old? Oh, I was about sixteen, I think. So around form four, going on to your form five, O levels. I was in form four. I was in form five. I went to school. I was one year earlier than most people. In That's right. You started school at six, so that it, yeah. and that mom at that time thought it would be a good idea to have yours, your sister and you start the same. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's the thing about com- competition. Eh? <laughs> but so I, I, when I went to his home to for the lessons. He would lend me books and so on. He would ask me what I was reading, and I would tell him. You know, I remember he would say, "What are you reading?" He saw me walking out of the school library. He said, "What's this you're reading?" And I showed him something called Marjorie Morning Star. He said, "That is absolute trash. You shouldn't be reading that." And he would throw me, throw things at me for me to read, like the Iliad, you know, the Odyssey. He even gave me a copy of the Quran. And he gave me a copy of something called the Hindu View of Life. Uh, he gave me he gave me his books. What was and his name, Gwani? His name V. Postop K. Postop Arumugam. Nice. It's like a long yes, name. Lankan name, yeah. Anyway, and then he gave me a book by Lin Yu Tang called The Importance of Living. So he was indirectly telling me that I was—I didn't know my roots, my cultural roots. So he was throwing these things at me to get me educated. And I remember reading in the town, and I became quite、um, impressed, you know. And suddenly I realized, gosh, yeah, being Chinese is not all about pearl as buck. That was all I knew about being Chinese before that, you know. So that was my. I think that was when I began to understand that I am not this and I'm not that. And so I disowned my English pet name and insisted on everyone calling me by my Chinese name. And that was at a tender age of like sixteen or seventeen. Yeah.、Mm. Yeah.、Mm. So basically, by that teenage sort of. Moving on to adulthood, you were already very conscious about being nationalistic. Oh no, that was much earlier. That was when I was about twelve or so. When nineteen fifty-seven, when we got independence, you know, there was generally a feeling,、uh, a strong feeling of nationalism that we, this was our country, you know, and being aware of of our nation's history, which I think not many people even nowadays learn, you know. One thing I find actually, Guang, when when a person goes away from the country that they were born in,、mm. we tend to yearn for and also miss a lot of things that you never thought about. So, <laughs> you know, to me, I think、uh, being away is always a very nice way to refine yourself, your character, and what what's important to you. As、mm. I'm sure your time away when you were in Germany. Um, you were telling me some very interesting stories. How, you know, how you actually got into reading literature in、uh, that university in Munich. Yeah, well, I went to Germany on a Goethe Institute scholarship, and so I was attending language classes and things like that at Goethe Institute. 
And the idea was that I should continue to go and do a, a teacher training. So the idea was that I would come back here and teach German. So I was in a small town called Murnau in the Alps, you know, for six months. And then I went, we then went to Munich to, at the Goethe Institute there to continue, you know, with the uh, language. Uh, classes and all that but I got terribly bored and I don't know I think I must have I'm the kind of person where if I'm bored everybody knows that kind of thing I suppose you know so <laughs> so the director of the good Institute at some point asked me if I was unhappy and if I would like to go home and I said no why would you think I'm unhappy he said why do you always speak English I said, well, that's because it's sort of my mother tongue, you know. And whom would I speak? Whom would I speak Malay to in this place, you know? Yeah, because he says, why don't you speak your native language? Like, you know, the Thai girls and the Korean girls. And I said, yeah, but, you know, my native language is Malay. Whom would I speak that to? And then I said to him, look, I said, I'm not unhappy in Germany. I'm very happy in Germany. But I said, maybe I'm too old for school in the Goethe Institute. I said, maybe I would be happier in a university. I said, why don't you change my scholarship so that I can go to university? And you know what? He did. He changed my scholarship from a Goethe Institute to a, a day a day, you know, the German Academic Exchange Scholarship. And I went to university. So while all my friends were doing their language lessons and all that, I was attending university but they allowed me to go back to Goethe Institute to get my major diploma in German language and culture and so on. Well, so, was, it, was it difficult for you to adjust with the language because it's so immersive right? when you're in a country that only speaks pretty much German? Well, the thing is this, you see that many of the fellows, my fellow students spoke English so it wasn't it. It was difficult to get to speak German. I guess if I were a man, I would be out drinking with guys and I would be learning much faster. But being a woman, and this is one of the disadvantages of being female, you know, is that I, I couldn't, and not being a very social, sociable sort of person, that was a major problem for me. But I, I met an an old German guy who was getting rid of his his old pickup you know the uh, the radio with the gr uh, gramophone player so he gave it to me and so I had this radio on all the time and so picked up the sounds of German and so on and so forth yeah so that's how I learned German no it was not difficult there was, I wanted to go to Germany because it fascinated me, the country fascinated me, you know, because, um, yeah, well, it just did, it, it still does. I still watch German movies and, and read German books and so on. So you have your book now translated to Italian. Mm -hmm. um, is Spanish on the way? No, <laughs> it's currently being translated into German. Okay, this it's is like Echoes, Echoes of Silence, right? Echoes of Silence, yeah. That's and, the one everyone likes. And that's available digitally as well? Like, can you buy it on Apple, iBooks or Amazon? No. How do we buy your books, Gwai? Well, you will have to send me an email with your postal address and you will have to pay some money into my banking <laughs> account. And then I will send you the books, yes. And um, you have a blog, I understand, mm. because we were looking at this. And yeah. your blog is your name, chuaguateng.blogspot.com. Yes. This is a very old blog, because I, I'm a blogger. So. <laughs> right. I stopped blogging yeah, for ages ago. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It um, became a chore, you know. In places like Australia and UK, the, the surname comes last. 
mm. in Malaysia Singapore standards, mm. our surname comes first, so it's very patriarchal. But, um, over in the Western sort of first world countries, the self is first. Mm. Yes, you are working on your third novel now. Yes, what is it about? I do not talk about what I'm working on. Okay, this is top secret. Because once you talk about it, the magic goes. Mm, yes, it dissipates. Yes, understand, understand. I I get that psyche. You do, huh? Mm. Your your PhD thesis it was um, discussing a Zen approach. Mm. Well, what did you mean by that? It's actually a reading procedure. You know, it's how to read fiction, and it's it's actually the way I read fiction. I've always read things differently from other people, I suppose, because I always saw more than other people. I never, I never wondered why. You know, I I was always amazed that other people didn't see what I I saw. I had absolutely no theory of mind at all. I just thought everyone thought like me. So it surprised me that they didn't see these things that I saw. But after I had finished my novel, I was promoting my first novel. I was promoting it, of course, and you know, going to universities to talk about it, to do readings and things like that. And there at that university, this was mid 1990s. They'd be talking about post-colonial theory and post-modernism and all these things. And I thought, wow! I thought the study of literature has moved on since I went to university. I've got to go and find out about this. So I went to University Kebangsaan, that's our national university, and I asked the lecturers there. I said. Do you think they would, you would allow? Would you allow me to go and do a master's? They say in what? I said, well, in you know, literary theory and Malaysian literature and English and all that. Of course, it has to be in English because my Malay is not good enough. And I, they asked me then if I would like to do an an exam course or a thesis course. You know, at the end of the course, do I write an exam or do I write a thesis? And I thought, oh my goodness, you know, another exam. You know, at that time I was nearly sixty, and I'm no exam for me. I write the thesis. So I, my supervisor at that time, then thinking like a lot of people do in a very stereotypical way, said she was very keen on um, helping postgraduate students develop reading uh, literary theories. That are not based on Western philosophies, but Asian philosophies. So, like Islamic philosophy, you know. From there, can you develop a literary theory? So she said to me, "You can do one on based on Buddhist Buddhism, can't you?" And I thought, "Oh, of course I can," you know. Not realizing that I actually knew next to nothing about Buddhism. Of course, you take for granted, ah,、oh, Buddhism, you know, Buddha and so on, so. But I ended up. Writing my master's proposal based on that, and when I had done that, when I had proposed this, and to this panel of people, you know, who were there, they said, "Look, they said, don't do this as a master's. This is not a master's thesis. This is a PhD thesis." <laughs> so they offered they offered me the chance to do a PhD without having to do a master's. Of course, it'd be quite a gamble because if I didn't get my PhD, I would also not get a master's, right? <laughs> I said, "Well, why not? You know, be hung for a sheep as for a lamb." So I said, "Yeah, let's do it." You know, and so I did. Now then, I found that one of the problems in Malaysia. Is that people didn't know how to read novels? They would take something and they would say, "Oh, this is," and then they would take a post-colonial theory to it, a feminist theory to it, and they will read it from a feminist point of view or from a post-colonial point of view or whatever. But of course, when you do that, you miss out a lot of what the book is really about. So they would do ridiculous things, like they would read. Joseph Conrad, 
from a post-colonial point of view and take his book apart. And then they will miss, they will, because they're so busy trying to prove that Joseph Conrad was pro-colonialism, mm. that they miss all the anti-colonial things in his in his books. He was extremely critical. So they bring they bring themselves exactly. into and I thought and then reading the, the business of reading and doing literary criticism becomes becomes war, you know. It becomes it becomes a battle. Everything becomes very warlike. Meaning you are going into the book with already preset exactly. conditions. So that that's the, the conflict, you know. You're in conflict, and you're stuck in that conflict because you take with you all that the tools of conflict. So I thought that what we need in Malaysia, because we are an, we are multi ethnic country, is we need to have a different way of reading, a way of reading that will allow us to understand other people's ethnicities. Where are they coming from? And so I use Buddhist philosophy to work out a method. That's why it's a Zen base. So basically what you're saying is prior to this challenge of taking on a PhD, you do not hold any Buddhist inclination? Well, you know, I was given a book called The Hindu View of Life at the age of 16, right? So that set me on a path to go and... And and I was given a copy of the Quran. So I was put on a path from an early age to explore all kinds of religions and thought systems and so on. And of course, Buddhism was very attractive to me because... Oh, I had a friend who who would take me to Buddhist uh, meetings, and so I wasn't like passionate or anything. It was just another thing to uh, occupy myself with. But when I started on my PhD, working on the thesis, trying to work out something, I became fascinated by it because you know it is not a religion at all. Buddhism is not a religion in the normal sense. It's a philosophy, and the best part of it is that it is. An epistemology. It's not a moral, it's not really a moral philosophy, it's an epistemological philosophy. How do we understand things? So it's an exploration of how your mind works, what consciousness is, and all that. And how do we understand things? So it was it was just right for the kind of thesis that I was doing to do, which was a method of how do you understand something. When you read it, just like how they say Buddhism is a, a way of life, so the approach, the way of seeing things, so that you see a little bit more than the next person, you see deeper. That's how I understand it. So I I use some of the tools that are found in Buddhist philosophy to use for reading fiction, and because every re- reading experience begins as an experience of conflict because you when you read you're encountering a different person and that person will not always agree with you there's always a sense of conflict i mean i've had people come and tell me oh you mustn't read uh nabokov's uh, you know the one where he's uh, where where it's humbert humbert lolita Nabokov's Loli. Don't read it because it's it's uh, it's about pedophilia. Of course, it's about pedophilia, but it's not it's not pornography. Of course, you are supposed to feel conflicted. Of course, you're supposed to feel uncomfortable with the book. But that's what reading is about. That's what making friends is about. So um, that's why my thesis is called "From Conflict to Insight." It's a it's a procedure that takes you from the initial conflict to a point where you begin to develop insights into what that book is about. Because the question we must really ask as readers is not why didn't the writer do this, that, but what we should be asking is why did this writer do it this way and not any other way? And that is a question you need to start with in order to to get deeper insights in, into the, the the book that you're reading yeah. from the reading experience so that's what my thesis is about so i wasn't i'm i'm still not a buddhist i mean okay okay i am a member i'm a life member of the vihara in good hills but that is a different thing altogether it's because when an uncle of mine died my father's brother i went to the, the wake and for the first time i saw a buddhist buddhist wake there were these Buddhist monks from the Theravada because my uncle, my family being from the north, they would have, if they had any religion at all, it would be Theravada Buddhism, like the Thai. So there were these monks 
they were sitting there, two of them, I think, and they were chanting from their sutra. So I saw this this wake, and I thought it was so beautiful because there were two these two monks. They were chanting their sutras, and uh, what they had they had put on the coffin was it my uncle died or my aunt? My aunt's death. They they had put on the on the coffin a glass of water with a white flower on it, a white rose. They tied a string to the rose stem, and that string went round to all the children. So it wrapped around their their fingers. And then it, and then the the monk would hold this thing and they would chant. And I thought, wonderful! That's a beautiful ceremony. I thought I didn't know what the significance of it was. I still don't know. I've, I've got to find out actually why a white rose, why the string. But it was a lot better than Chinese funerals I had seen with the clashing of cymbals and drums and all that and the noise. And I thought, yeah. I said, when I die, that's what I want. So I went and and signed up. To be a life member of the vihara. Is it Tibetan? You no, know, you know, it's Sri Lankan. Mm, okay, that figures. Mr. V K Arumugam must be smiling. Uh, no, 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 no. The vihara thing, the Theravada thing, was from a, a family friend who was very much into it. Went to the monastery. It, you know, they do this. Buddhist young boys, yeah, they will go at various times in their life. They will go to the to the monastery. To the vihara, and they will meditate and so on for like three months. They will become little monks for uh, about three months, and then they come out again. So that was from an, a family friend who got me involved in the in the philosophy of it because it's all very it's all logic, and to me, reason and logic appeals a great deal. So I always found Buddhism appealing, shall we say? It doesn't make me uh, I I don't go to the Temple and pray and all that kind of things. That all that is kind of the you know, outside my scope of experience. I I don't belong in that field. But it's got nothing to do with Mr. Vk Arumugam because he was a Hindu. You asked me to talk about women, right? But not many women have influenced me. The people who have influenced me have been men. And Vicky Arumugam was a major influence because he taught me. He opened my mind, and I think that's the best gift you can give anyone to you know, a young person. So he was a wonderful teacher. Actually, he was a lousy teacher in class <laughs> because half the time he was sorrowful. He, He was an alcoholic, so he would be drunk most of the time. He was quite old, but he, I loved him. I loved him so much, you know, because he was sort of the very person I needed in my life at that time to, you know, to open the door, to open the windows of my mind. You know. That's so heartwarming to hear. Yeah, well, I I have been. I have to say that I have been on the whole. I'm no nasty people, of course, you know. But on the whole, I think I have been very lucky in that, in the midst of nastiness and all that, there have always been people who have been there to help me out of a particular situation or showed me ways out. And I have to say this: that most of the time, they are men. The men in my life, generally, especially from my childhood, have generally been very kind. So, in my stories, sometimes somebody has pointed out that I am very pro patriarch because I don't have nasty men. There are, of course, nasty men in my stories. But in the in the beginning, we, I, we, I would be writing stories where very often a woman in trouble would be helped out of a situation by a man. But it's not to do. It's got nothing to do with gender. So really, I have no time for this feminism and this woke. Culture kind of thing, it it's got little to do with it. I don't hate women, but in the scheme of things, the way life is, it's a man's world. And if you are a woman, as I was in a man's world, as I was in advertising, very often the people who are going to help you out of situations are the men. They are in a position to do so. Women will are good for 
you know, providing you with a Kleenex and the tea, you know, <laughs> when you have problems. In my experience, right? It's the men who are going to give you the practical solutions. There was a, actually a man. I, I didn't know him very well. He was a client at the agency where I was. And um, he could see that I was troubled. I was always having trouble with my co-workers because they thought I was arrogant. Maybe I was. But I have this way of thinking very quickly, you see. So before you can finish, I already know what you're going to say and I'm going to give you the answer because really, I don't have the time to listen to you waffling and waffling, you know, kind of thing. <laughs> I was awful, I was awful. But so people didn't like me. But this man, this man, he was a medical doctor. He said to me, he said, Quat, he said, you must learn something. You can't fight all your own battles. You've got to find somebody who can help you. Find. So you need a champion. And very often in the working world, of course, in the kitchen, it might be a woman, it would be a different thing. But I have no time for kitchens. In the working world, it's usually men. It's usually men. So apologies to the feminists. No apologies, actually. I think it's a silly thing. It's a silly thing to divide the world into genders and and make make that the basis of your life. Gender equality? Yes. I don't think about it in terms of gender. If you're human, so I'm a humanist. So everyone deserves equal opportunities. But we can't be equal because we're not born equal. That is, we are not made equal. There's no way we can be equal. We can be given equal opportunities. That's the main thing. And from that, we will, we will take, make use of these opportunities and become what we are supposed to be. And what we are supposed to be is dictated, I don't believe in fate, but it's dictated by your genes and by your education, by your background and, you know, the language you speak and all that kind of thing. That's it. So, equal opportunities. I don't believe in equality. It's something that never happens. It's not supposed to happen. If we were supposed to be equal, we would all be made like robots, no? We would have evolved like robots. And you know what? I think that's where we are going. To be robots? We are heading there with AI, artificial intelligence and so on. And we are we are moving to a different kind of industrial world. And there's some, some kind of faulty logic there, you know, Jasmine? <laughs> if we were going to be robots, why would we have to develop AI? Because it will be us. <laughs> <laughs> it's because we are not robots that we need to create robots. So you need to think about that. Since the turn of the century, the 1900s, and then the Industrial Revolution, we've been wanting to create more time for ourselves using machines to do the work. My, my great-grandfather, for example, I just did some digging in history, and he was... Uh, it comes from a background where his father used to make uh, horse carriages in oh, Penang. Right. And then they evolved at that turn of the century, 100 years ago. Mm. At that turn of the century, they even had the Spanish flu or the Singapore fever. Mm. But I was just thinking 100 years ago, and they were going through a very similar kind of industrialization where it was from manual going to machines and mm. then, you know, from horses to, mm. to motor cars. And I was able to dig up some very interesting excerpts from newspapers and mm. uh, stories, anecdotes. Then we think about us now, a hundred years later, and we think that we are so advanced. They were already thinking that they were advanced a hundred years ago. Well, at every stage, right, in life, it's like that, isn't it? I think so. And... As, as humans, we always think that we are already at that boundary where we have done so much. But there's so much more to come. I don't think so. I no? think we're, we're like scratching the bottom. You know, we're right at the starting point. We haven't gone very far, but progress has to happen, right? Because you know why? Because we're lazy. We'd rather not work if we didn't have to. 
which I think is a great thing. You know, there's more to life than just just working. You know, unless you enjoy the work, then it's fun. Right? But if you're doing something and it's a chore, you know, just to put food on the table to stay alive. It's terrible. And so I, I'm a great believer in progress in AI and things like that. If you think of robots to do the work, why not? Fantastic. Because then we as human beings are free to do the kind of things we want to do. We can go and paint and draw. You know, and maybe there's a Marxist thought. I am Marxist. Yeah, that's it. You've got to free the mind to do the things that you want to do. No, I don't think I don't think we are going to be robots. I think the invention of robot will make us more more human. A lot of the inhumanity I think in in human beings comes from this competition for food, this need to survive. So you become inhuman. You be, you begin to feel that if somebody succeeds, you will somehow have less. This is the reason for all the prejudices and the you know the resentments that people feel. You know. Competition. So, the United States, for instance, they feel that if China does well, then the Un- United States and the Western world must collapse. Like there's nothing left for them. It's it's such a sad, sad way to be. You know, it's much nicer to think, yeah, okay, it's, but it's a big world. If we work together, we can make make the pie bigger. I don't know, maybe because people who think like that, generally, when you think about it, the Americans, Australians, you know, and the Europeans and all that, many of them have migrant genes. They came from somewhere else to somewhere. So you see the same thing with, say, our diaspora Chinese. They're very competitive. And there is also my, if the Malays are going to get everything, we are going to have nothing. <laughs> Such a silly, silly attitude to have, you know, because we have more rich Chinese people in Malaysia than we have rich Malay people, right? Where the opportunities were then, the Chinese have made use of those opportunities. You cannot be equal. There is no way anyone can be equal with anyone else. Even twins are not equal. I I really like that thought that you've left us with, Kwai. I think you're, you're absolutely right in saying that... Um, it's about having equal opportunities. Yeah. And it's when you begin to want equal equality, which is something that doesn't exist, actually. It does not exist. Identical twins are not equal. Have you thought of that? Then inhumanity creeps in. In your behavior towards people, you become unkind. You want to bully people, you know. You want them to be like you. So if you're groveling in the dirt, you want them to grovel, grovel with you in the dirt. There's no way they can stand above you. No, you've got to come down to my level. Mm. I find that pathetic. Again, there's an old Branakan disdain, you know. I've become disdainful of this thing. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah, I'm guilty of being superior to people. I think it's not superior. <laughs> it's uh, as what you rightly said as well. It's the ability to see beyond emotions. I suppose, yeah. It's logic, you know, pure logic for me. Kwan Eng, thank you so very much for sharing such deep insights into how your mind ticks. People who have read your novels, uh, short stories, would, would love to know the person behind all these amazing stories that you've woven with a, another one coming up soon. Uh, yeah. And if anybody wants to buy your book, they can email you at yes. guateng7, guateng7 at gmail.com. G-U-A-T-E-N-G 7 at gmail.com. If people want digital, then I, they have to swear on, on their honour that they will not go and share my stories with everybody. But of course, they could do it they could do it with books as well. They could just lend to their friends. I think we need to get your books into libraries. Yeah. Mm. In well, Australia. A- everywhere. But I, I honestly, I'm not a businesswoman. I write because I have to. Because if I don't, things worry me, you know. So I've got to get it, work it out of my system. I honestly can't be bothered. The, the reason, do you know the reason why I published it? It's so that I can get on, move on to the next one. 
because if I don't publish those books, I will keep bothering about it. You know, if Echoes of Silence was still in manuscript form, I would still be working on it. So I've got to like publish it, put it out there so I cannot touch it anymore so that I can move on to work on my second novel and so on. So That's the only reason I publish. So publishing is really like just closing the chapter. Yeah, so I can move on. Yeah, you're saying, okay, cake bake. Can we have a hint on what you're working on next? Just an emotion. Mm. Well, no, I will tell you this, that it is, you know, echoes of silence. There's echoes of silence, then days of change. Days of change is actually a follower of echoes of silence. It's not, the, it's, it's the same kind of situation, but told by somebody else. This the third one is again the same situation. It's the same place. It's Ulubanir. It's more or less the same group of people. But the whole story is told by somebody else. So I have, if you like, a fixed fictional world, Ulubanir. And then I write around it. It'll probably be my last novel because I'm thinking I wanted to write a trilogy. Mm. And, you know. Not much time left or any much more to be content there, you know. At my back, I always hear time's winged chariot hurrying near. I'm going to... I'm going to read from Echoes of Silence and I'm going to read from it a little bit about the book. It is written sort of like a love story. It's also a a murder mystery. It's also a, a historical. It's about the history of a family. So it's written really to be enjoyed. But of course, there are hidden messages underneath the uh the way the story is written. So, for instance, the person who's telling the story is an, a Malaysian Chinese woman who has fallen in love with an Englishman whom she met in Germany. And it's not about me. For me, it was a way of trying to explore. See, I felt one of the reasons why we had so many problems in in Malaysia between races, between the different ethnic groups, you know, is that it's all because of of colonialism. Even the attitude of superiority that some people have towards others is the result of colonialism. So I thought then that the book would explore where in colonialism does it begin, you know? And from that point, I got this feeling that people like me, like my father's family, you know, being English educated and all that, we, and without roots to our Chineseness, we have no more roots, you know, we are lost. We are sort of like the children of colonialism. We are the orphans. We have no parents. We are actually orphans, you know. So, um, this feeling of not belonging anywhere is here. But what I wanted to explore in this... So, if we think of ourselves as children, then somewhere at the beginning, there must have been a liaison between the colonial and the Asian, right? How did it happen, you know? So, I told in this novel, the... Love affairs, all the love affairs in in the novel are between a Westerner and a native person, right? So the narrator is Malaysian Chinese, her lover is English. In the story, there is uh, uh, also a Chinese Malay, Malayan, Malayized woman and she has, her lover is is, uh, an Englishman. And then there is 
an English girl was actually Eurasian. Her her mother was a Eurasian. So the whole line of Eurasians, you know, and she she but she grew up in England so she's white, considered white, and her lover is a Malay man. So all the re- relationships in this book have to do not just inter-ethnic but inter um cultural inter geographical almost right it's about all the love stories are about the story of colonialism right uh well let let me just read this part where um she is describing how Ailian the the the, the narrator is a woman called Ailian and the lover is an Englishman called Michael Michael Templeton So here she's describing the the relationship when they first became lovers. We became lovers, Michael and I. Or perhaps I should say I became Michael's lover, choosing the word carefully. Because in the simplest sense of the word, I was. I loved him. I loved him physically. Long after we became lovers, I often startled myself at the way a sudden sharpened awareness of some trivial aspect of his body such as the shape of his nose the angle of his elbow the suppleness of his fingers could make me melt with desire I loved him for his intellect for his knowledge of so many things for his experience for his wit for his accomplishments as a musician I loved him for his hedonism, for his love of good food, for his appreciation of good wines, and yes, for his knowledge of my body. Until then, an undiscovered country to myself. I love him as clay must love its potter, because in a sense he made me. Seeing the desire in his eyes as he took pleasure in my body. seeing how much it is him to see me take pleasure in my own body i assumed the liberty as a being not a complex or profound being merely an elemental physical being but through him beautiful desirable precious capable of indescribable joy I was too innocent then to think in terms of giving and taking of using and being used all that was to come later at that time there was only the sublime sweetness of hungry surrender and generous desire i want you please take me so this in this description of of her love for Michael hidden in all this description is of course the question of colonial the colonial the meeting between the colonial and the colonize the colonizer and the colonize at some point according to Ilian the way I saw it writing this out which became clear to me is that at some point there is a worship a worship of the colonizer no then i will read to you a little bit where she discovers her grandmother whom she had never known right she grew up as um as the only child of english educated parents who had little time for her and she never knew who her parents who that she had grandparents So here is she talking about the background. I mean, I was an only child. Although I was given to understand by my parents that I had a large circle of relatives on my father's side, I never had anything to do with any of them. On my mother's side, there was only an elderly spinster aunt who was so grim and had so little patience with children that I hardly ever saw her. Once when he was in an unusually communicative mood, my father told me that my grandfather Lim, like many wealthy Chinese men in his day, had several wives 
and an unknown number of children. My father was the only son of the youngest wife. Soon after he was born, my grandfather died. My grandmother then returned to her parents with her father and lost touch with her Lim family. I should like to be able to say that my grandmother left the Lim household a rich woman, or that from some abject poverty, or that from abject poverty, my father built himself a fabulous fortune. That is the stuff on which myths involving the overseas Chinese are made. But my father was not so obliging. He was a singularly dull man. He was a government servant. My mother, also educated in English, was a school teacher. While they were at work, I was left in the care of a long line of servants who came and went without making any impact on me. The only bright spot in my life as a child was the fact that we lived in one of a row of government quarters and I had the neighbor's children to play with. Should I continue? Yes, please. My mother's, my mother's being a teacher gave her some status in that small community. A status she was not reluctant to make the most of. I, a product of what was then the Malayan middle class, English educated government servants, did better at school than many others who came from non-English speaking homes. All that and the knowledge that my grandfather had been rich gave me a feeling of superiority. Except for that one time when my father told me about Grandfather Lim, he had not spoken of his family. And since I had never met his mother, I assumed she was dead. When I was seven, however, my mother had to go for an operation. It was not... It was time to coincide with my school holidays so that I could be sent away, presumably because the combination of a convalescence <coughs> and my presence would have been too great a strain on the servants. I was then told that I would be spending the, the holidays with my papa. Papa is grandma, yeah? My father took me there to my grandma. It was so far from where we lived that he had to hire a private taxi. After almost a day of travelling, we came to a stop along a small road. There was no house in sight, and all I could see was a rough bridge made from planks and coconut trunks thrown across a large ditch. But my father asked me to get out and started to take my bag out of the car, out of the boot. He had to carry me across the bridge because nothing would induce me to walk on it. We came to a group of wooden shacks, which I know now to have been squatter huts, built by someone who did not own the land, but saw an opportunity here for a lucrative enterprise. He had built the poor homes out of wood and atap. It's the kind of roofing made from the leaves of palms. And the poor homes out of wood and atap and rented them out cheaply, I hope, to those who were too busy scraping together a daily subsistence to see the same opportunities their dubious landlord did. My grandmother took me to visit them once during my stay with her and I discovered that the little community, exclusively Chinese and all vaguely related to one another, consisted of a tri-shop peddler, a lorry driver, two lorry attendants and a couple who mixed bottles of coloured powder in large tubs of water to be re-bottled and sold to ice water hawkers in the nearby village. I liked the house best. It was fragrant with the sharp essences of chemical orange, lime, sassafrilla and rose. But on that day, my father and I walked right past them. We came to the beginning of a footpath leading into what I thought was a forest but was in fact an abandoned rubber small holding. It was a world filled with movements and sounds. The tree branches above and the undergrowth below rustled and sighed. Birds sang, bees, uh, insects chirruped, crows cawed, unseen animals called, and occasionally ripe rubber seeds burst in sudden explosive cracks. 
a town bred child, I had never been near so much vegetation, earth, mud and streams before. All I knew about forests were based on the English children's stories I had read. As the undergrowth became thicker, visions of wolves and bears came to my mind. I began to worry about witches and children being abandoned by their hard pressed parents. The question worrying me all morning had to be asked, Papa, who's Popo? She's your grandmother. Grandmother? I have a grandmother. Why haven't I met her before? Because she lives too far away, as you can see. Is she your mother or Mama's mother? She's my mother. Why didn't you tell me about her? What's there to tell? She's your grandmother, that's all. What about Mama's mother? Is she alive too? I was beginning to get my first inkling of how secretive even deceptive my parents had been. Your mama's mother is dead, you know that. I did not, because no one had told me. Papa, I don't think I want to stay with Popo. It's too late, said my father. She's expecting you and besides, here we are. I saw ahead of us a little wooden hut with an attap roof. Next to it was a large shed, similarly roofed. In front of the shed stood a thin old woman in black trousers and a blue Chinese blouse. Amma, said my father when we approached. Papa, I addressed her in greeting as I had been taught. My voice caught in my throat. Frightened of me, are you? She said in Cantonese and stretched out a skinny, wrinkled, large-veined, brown-spotted hand to stroke my head. I shrank back and clung to my father. You see? She said in a mildly reproachful manner to my father. You never bring her to see me. No wonder she's afraid of me. No need to be afraid, turning to me. Let me show you something. I understood her only because I had learned a smattering of Cantonese from the servants. In fact, because the only Cantonese I had ever heard was spoken by servants, and because my grandmother was dressed like one, I thought she was a servant. It was difficult to connect what I thought of as a lowly station with someone who was a member of my family. I think I began to reject her from that moment. Well, on, on that note, Chua Guat Eng, thank you so much for being a part of the Listen by Heart podcast. It's really been been an honour to to speak with you to understand what goes on that creative mind of yours <laughs> <laughs> I really really look forward to meeting you in person well thank you for inviting me to take part in this I hope that you go on to do lots more interesting interviews with lots of people we have quite a number of women writers you have been listening to Jasmine Lowe's audio journey experience and AFT podcast production so you can subscribe to the podcast on your preferred platform on Apple Podcasts Spotify Deezer and so on Google Podcasts and if you like encourage us on on this project you can click on to our website listenbyheart.webprojects w-e-b-p-r-o-j-x dot com the Listen by Heart podcast is an audio project that sets out to record and archive stories from women of the South China Sea, an area of much interest lately. As we document and record all of these stories, we will also be digitizing and creating an online presence for women of Southeast Asian heritage and honoring the women and men who came before them. Our mission is to serve as sentinels of the South China Sea, keeping our region at peace. Thank you for listening. See you next time.